We have too much what if in our society. What if this happens? What if that happens? We should stop focusing on what if and start focusing on what should be. And you know what should be? If you have a $16,000 battery pack and you have a nozzle break off of it, what should be is that you fix the battery pack rather than recycle that thing and charge someone $16,000. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Today we're going to discuss Tesla wanting $16,000 to fix a Model 3 that had an issue with the nozzle on the battery. Not the cells in the battery, not all the banks in the battery, the nozzle for the coolant system for the battery got hit with a little piece of road debris, $16,000, because they were unwilling to do the repair that Rich Rebuild did in his channel. I highly suggest you check out this video. Even when he is not discussing Tesla, his channel's hysterical. I'm just kidding. Like, I've met people on YouTube before. There are people I've met with over a million subscribers, not going to say who that I, I wouldn't even let pet Clinton. He's one of those people that's really humble, hardworking, honest, kind in person, a good dude, not different off camera than he is on camera. And I really appreciate what he does on his channel. And a lot of this stuff is even when it has nothing to do with the car is genuinely hysterical. So this video over here is showing where this broke. So this thing that you see over here is where the coolant system is going to attach so that coolant can go through this cooling system that cools the battery. You don't want your, your lithium ion battery to pull a unit pack power on you and explode. So what you do is when you have it fast charging or fast discharging is you cool it. And you also use the cells the customer paid for. You don't put in some knockoff bullshit and claim that it's a Samsung 35E, but that is solved for a different video. So this over here is the nozzle, and it broke. So what they did in this video, it, after Tesla said, we need to replace this entire pack, is it looks like they used a basic utility knife or a box cutter, and they cut off that broken nozzle, they smoothed it out, they threaded it with this tool over here. After they put some new threads in it, it looks like they screwed in the uh, different little piece. After they screwed both ends, they cleaned it out, and they put this little piece in here after they made the threads, and they put some sealant on it so that it would be sealed so that the coolant wouldn't come out over time. And after that, they reattached the hose. This is the coolant hose over here. They closed it up, and it worked. So they had a working car. So instead of paying $16,000 to replace the entire battery pack, literally thousands of cells in there that would have been wasted, they did it for 700 bucks in this video. If you wanted to do it yourself, you could try to do it yourself. And there's a few different angles that I want to come at this from. The first is design. So on my channel, I often go over how Apple has a lot of silly asinine design flaws that don't make sense to me. For instance, putting a 52-volt power line right next to a 1-volt data line that goes to the CPU on the edge of the machine where water comes in, ensuring that if you just so much have, as have a humid room, that there is a chance that your CPU is going to get 52 volts. That's an overclock that even Linus is not going to get to work properly. And this is something that you see here. So if you have this point of failure that can cause a $16,000 battery to be made useless, then why wouldn't you design it in a way where if road debris hits this, that it is fixable at your service center? Because some people have said that this is a ghetto fix. This is not something that's going to last. I disagree. But even if that's the case, why would you not design this in a way where if any one of these nozzles breaks, that you can just pop a new one in rather than have it sealed onto this $16,000 part? The second thing to address here is the fact that they were unwilling to do this at the factory or at the Tesla service center. Their only solution is to replace the entire battery. So if you have debris hit the bottom of your car, their solution is get a new battery, even if the problem is this one little thing with the cooling system. And this is very similar to what I've discussed with Apple. In this particular video I did over here, the guy had a bad screen cable. Everything else was fine. I went over that board in a microscope for all the people that claim that it was horribly liquid damaged, and I went over that in this video for anybody who has questions about it, addressing bias in the CBC News video. In this video, this guy showed up, and he had a laptop with nothing on the screen. And it looks like he made a common mistake while opening the device for service. I'll plug in and plug in the screen back in. We see this all the time, or when they put the screen cable back in, because it's very short, they try to stretch it over and to fit it in if they're not right on the wire right, 
And what they did was they bent pin one, which is the LCD backlight. It winds up shorting LCD backlight to ground, which turns off the backlight in that machine. So what we did was we bent it back. 90% of the customers that come here, probably 99% pay the 75 to 150 bucks to have us replace the screen cable. The 1% that are okay with this ghetto fix that may or may not last are usually people that are so broke that they, they can't afford 150 bucks. And we tell them that this is this, I don't know if this is gonna last, but here this works. And they usually come back once they're not broke with all their business and they tell all their friends. That's part of my business model. That's how we do business. And it works for us. It, it's worked very well. And this is the same genuine concept here where they said it may be $1,100, but it could go up to 2000 in this video when all it needed was the screen cable. And the difference with this video versus the Tesla video is that with Tesla, at the very least, they were able to say, this is the only thing that's broken, but we're replacing everything. Whereas with Apple, they didn't even see that the screen pin was bent. They just decided to replace everything before they even knew this is the problem. We're just going to replace everything. But it's the same general mindset of let's not try to work with what we have. Let's just start from scratch and replace everything regardless of what's wrong. And that is evident in this video. That is evident in what, what Rich Rebuilds did. The third part and the most important part to discuss in this video is the title of it. So it says, this is the importance of right to repair. So I want to try and avoid confusion on what right to repair is and the different spokes of right to repair here. So this is gonna sound a little controversial. When it comes to the legislative process and right to repair, what he did in this video, in my opinion, has nothing to do with legislative right to repair at all. It has to do with cultural right to repair. So there's a video I did a few years ago Right to repair, 99% inspiration, 1% legislation. What does that mean? It means that right to repair is a concept. It is a philosophy. It's an idea more than it is a law. It's the idea that when you buy something, you own it. The idea that when you, what you own breaks, that you shouldn't simply have to be forced to replace everything on it to make it work again, that you can use your ingenuity, your logic, your reason, and your skill set to keep your property working again, and that you have the right and the ability to do that. And this over here is right to repair, but there's nothing I see in this video that would be changed with a right to repair law. What you see in this video is something that would be changed if society adopted a more right to repair mindset. So what is right to repair legislatively? Right to repair legislatively says that a manufacturer can't restrict you. So let's say that the chip that controls charging on this device dies. I should be able to go over to Texas Instruments or Intersil or one of their vendors and be able to purchase that chip. They shouldn't be able to go over to Renaissance or Intersil and say, don't sell this chip to anybody else, even if they need it. You're not allowed to have this. You can't have this. We can't sell it to you because the manufacturer restricted it. That's legislative right to repair or if there is manuals or schematics and diagrams that show you how to repair the device, those need to be made available. That's part of legislative right to repair. Now, nowhere in this video do I see any sort of proprietary parts being used. What was used here, and please do correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not trying to pretend I'm a mechanic, I'm not a car person. What was used here where it was stuff that looks like you could get at Home Depot. Like that little tool that he used to cut off the nozzle, that looked like a basic utility knife you could get at a 99 cent store. The tool that he used to thread the hole, that looks like something you could get at Home Depot. The sealants that he put after he screwed in that little piece, that little, uh, I, I, I forget the name of it because I'm an idiot, that he attached both sides of the, of the nozzle to, that looks like something you could get at Home Depot. Everything that he did here looks like it could have been done with the something at Home Depot, with the exception of the lift that he used to lift the car up, which even that I imagine you could get at whatever vendor you go to, to when you're setting up a mechanic shop. So legislatively, legislatively speaking, there is nothing in right to repair that would have changed this outcome at Tesla or at Rich Rebuilds. But what this video demonstrates is the importance of cultural right to repair, philosophical right to repair, us embracing as a culture that when the manufacturer says you need to replace the entire battery, that that dude has a little bit of healthy skepticism and he says, no, I'm not paying $16,000 because a nozzle broke off of my battery when 99% of the cost of that battery are the actual cells themselves and not that nozzle, not that cooling system. So he had, in his mind, the philosophical concept that the manufacturer is not always right with their repair center, and that's good. And then he went over to Rich, and Rich is a dude that is open to doing hard work, he's open to taking things apart, 
learning how those systems work, learning how to work on them properly, and not taking no for an answer from the manufacturer. So he decided to use basic common sense in his brain, as did his technicians, and they saw, hmm, $16,000 battery, a nipple broke off, or a nozzle. Raging debate in his comment section right now. The nipple broke off. What if we just figure out how to reattach the nipple? And we do it properly. We seal it properly. We caulk it properly. All that stuff. We test it. We make sure it works. That's, I, that's an idea. That's the philosophy of right to repair that he's applying right there. Not the legislative side, because the legislative side is about making schematics and documents available and making chips available when the manufacturer stops you. Ain't nobody stopping you from going to Home Depot and buying a utility knife, that little grommet-looking thingy that he had, and the... The, that had the threads on both sides that I'm going to feel really stupid at the end of the video because I my brain is completely blanking on what that thing is called. Uh, that, and all the stuff that he got there, that stuff that you, looks like you could buy at a basic hardware store. What matters is a society where people believe that this is a good thing, that this is okay. That's where this matters. Now, I'm seeing comments from people saying, this may not be safe. The manufacturer said that you're, that you're not supposed to do that, so I don't think Rich should have done that. He did something that Elon said you're not supposed to do. No. That's the problem. That's where the problem lies. That's not in the law in this particular case. The problem lies in us for thinking that it is okay in any way, shape, or form that we replace this entire effing battery because of that. Now, in this video, 99% inspiration, 1% legislation. Let's talk a little bit about the inspiration because a lot of people will say that I should come at this from an environmental angle. I should talk about climate change, uh, emissions, waste, and all that type of stuff. And to be honest, I don't always focus on that on this channel. I very rarely actually focus on the climate effect on this channel. And I want to explain why. Right to repair is 1% legislation, 99% inspiration. What inspired this gentleman to go to a guy on YouTube instead of have his car fixed by Tesla. In that moment, do you think he was thinking about the environmental impact of disposing of a lithium battery? Do you think he was thinking about the environmental impact of another uh, set of copper and nickel and lithium being mined or carbon that would be uh, tossed into the atmosphere by the production of a new battery or the exploration in a new mine of new lithium? No, he was thinking about the waste from his wallet. He was thinking about the, not the waste of copper or the waste of nickel or the waste of lithium. He was thinking about the waste of maybe a quarter of his year's salary. This is what matters to people. And this is what inspires people. And that's why this is what I talk about. That's why I talk about a $75 to $150 repair that they wanted $2,000 for rather than the environmental impact of the motherboard going into a landfill. If you don't believe me, just look at where, I don't know, Greta Thunberg or something like that gets mentioned on Facebook, and you will see the culture war backlash and all this other stuff, because anything that comes to the environment nowadays, or climate change, or like oil versus renewable energy, or any of this stuff, or ice cars versus EVs, it's become... A, a giant cultural war, and cultural wars don't get anywhere. But there are universals in this world that get people, regardless of where they are in the political or philosophical spectrum, on board, and that's not when you talk about wasted nickel or copper, it's when you talk about their money. And that is how you start to get people inspired and into this. When they get a $2,000 bill and you fix it for free with a tweezer, when they get a $16,000 bill and you're like, hey, we'll, we'll charge you 5% of that and and you just and you screw something in and you do your work and you fix it up. That's what gets people inspired. And I think it's important that this happen more and more often to get more and more people on board because you could talk about the environment so you're blue in the face. To many people, that's something that's far off into the distance. It's something that's abstract and theoretical. It's not something that they can make the direct connection to. A $16,000 bill, oh, that hurts. That hurts. So that is something to uh, think about here. And the only area where I think this could be thought of in terms of right to repair legislation is because they've put this gentleman on camera and shown his name. There are people that would say, well, now Tesla may disable charging at their stations because Rich modified the battery by fixing the cooling system by putting the nozzle back on there. And I've seen people say that Tesla should retain the right to be able to say you can't charge at their station if you had it fixed elsewhere. And there is an interesting debate to be had here. And But it really does show how the culture and the philosophy has moved so much more. It was 40 or 50 or 70 or 90 years ago. So you could say that lithium is dangerous. Correct. You could say that charging an improperly repaired or assembled lithium battery could start a fire. Correct. You could say fire is dangerous. 
Correct. You could say it's damaging to a brand when that company's device is seen on fire. Correct. You could also say that for the last hundred years that we have been driving vehicles that are powered by a flammable liquid that flows through the vehicle at all times. So while your car is on, there is flammable liquid flowing through the vehicle at all times, and you can have that fixed at the mechanic down the street that has no authorization from the manufacturer whatsoever, and we are totally okay with this as a society. You could also fix your brakes yourself in your garage. You don't need a license. You don't need to take a class. You don't have to have any sort of certification done. And then after you fix your brakes yourself, even if you have no clue what you're doing, you could take that 5,000 pound vehicle. You could take it on the highway at 70 miles an hour. And you don't even have to bring it to someone to see if you did the brake change right. You could just figure out on your own why you're going 70 miles an hour if your brakes work. We accept that as a society. We used to have a society where we valued freedom over the constant nonstop what if of greedy overprotective Karens that care about their money, that care about the company's money more than they care about our freedoms. This is, what if the battery explodes? What if this happens? What if it doesn't cool and it breaks? What if the car that you're driving that is filled with flammable liquid flowing through it all the time blows up? Which has happened! We're going to get to the point in this conversation where we talk about the potential disabling of this vehicle by Tesla to charge their superchargers because of this improper battery repair. And one thing I think that's important to note is while you may, if you modify an electric vehicle and you mess up the battery, it could cause a fire. One thing you should understand about an internal combustion engine vehicle is you don't even have to try and repair the vehicle if you're an idiot to set it on fire. It actually happens almost every day across America. Let's take a look and see. So it happen quick. It's a video you don't see every day. A fire sparking at the VP Racing Fuels gas station in Stuttgart. It moves from the car to the pump. It's believed to have started from a cigarette. We don't get rid of gas stations now, do we? Just because we have idiots in the world? No. But the thing is, uh, uh, internal combustion engine vehicles come from a time where we accept, we had a higher risk tolerance so that we could be free as a people. And we're kind of grandfathered into that. But as we move on to electric vehicles, now we're focusing on these things that we used to not care about, but now we do because we're, even though we used to have that exact same danger in the past, now we pretend that it's a much larger danger and we must restrict your freedom because of the constant what ifs. And that's the thing, when it comes to new platforms of computing or new different types of technologies for electric vehicles, it's not the technology that inherently makes it unfixable, it's the fucked up anti-repair mentality that has permeated our culture that makes those devices unfixable. And it's important to make that distinction. I could see this being a rights repair topic legislatively if they turn off his charging. Now, I've heard the argument made before that Tesla's brand could be damaged and people are constantly tr just trying to destroy Tesla as a company. I notice a very interesting dynamic going on there with Tesla. It's kind of like the dynamic with Trump where he'll say something and it'll be a little radical that may have a small kernel of truth to it and people will agree with it and then the media absolutely takes a shit on him and then people become very defensive of him because they agreed with him and the media said something bad about him. So they become really hardened in their position. And then the Trump actually says something that's genuinely stupid and dumb. But the people that were really hardened to their position by the media wind up defending him on the stupid shit that he says. And, and then people start associating their identity with the politician or the brand that they are now defending after having defended them from the media and everything else. And then you kind of get this thing where people's identity gets wrapped up in the brand of the politician that they agreed with after they got attacked by the media. And then they wind up in some point just standing for them and regardless of what they say or do. I see a very similar dynamic occurring with Tesla and I see that people are very protective of Tesla and the brand. So when they say we need to protect our brand by ensuring that nobody else fixed this car because if anybody else fixes this car and something goes wrong with it, we're going to get blamed in a way that no other company is going to get blamed. I hear what they're saying. I respect their point. I understand where they're coming from. But at the same time, this is not the direction that society needs to go. And this is the direction that society is going if anybody has any doubts. As I said, when there was a right to repair bill on the ballot in Massachusetts last year, and you look at the people that were lobbying against this bill, Tesla's name is not here on this paper. Tesla is not one of the people in opposition. You got General Motors, so that's that that's Chevy, that's a GMC, that's all your major Amer iconic American brands. You have Toyota, Ford, 
Honda, and Nissan. They put over $25 million in so that this committee could run advertisements saying that if independents fix your car, you will be raped in a parking lot. This is not the direction that we need to be going in. We can't have you replace a nozzle. What if you do it wrong? What if the battery overheats? What if it goes on fire? We can't let you charge. We have to re- you, you don't understand. We have to replace everything. We have too much what if in our society. What if this happens? What if that happens? We should stop focusing on what if and start focusing on what should be. And you know what should be? If you have a $16,000 battery pack and you have a nozzle break off of it, what should be is that you fix the battery pack rather than recycle that thing and charge someone $16,000. That's the direction that we need to be going in. But that's not something that's going to be accomplished legislatively. That's something that's going to be accomplished ideologically and philosophically when enough people get inspired to go back to the society that we used to have when it comes to repair where we actually fix things and we used common sense rather than trust the manufacturer. And that inspiration, in my opinion, is not going to come from talking about climate change or environmental impact or waste lithium and copper, even though all that stuff is true. In my opinion, I'm not saying it's not true. That inspiration is going to come from people's wallets. When you're not talking about e-waste, when you're talking about financial waste, because this is what people respond to. That's what that gentleman responded to. That's what Rich responded to. And that's what that's what I think motivates people. And I think there needs to be more stories like this that are shared so that our profession, our craft, what we do is not seen as just something that in the abstract will help us keep temperatures from hitting over three Celsius over target by the year 2100, but rather will be seen as we will keep you from being financially destroyed in August of 2021. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something. Leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think, and I will see you all in the next video. Bye now.